Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, what I will try to do now is not destroy what Guy destroyed, but what, like, try to land what we have now and what we can do right now with, with IPC, because there's an MVP and actually you can start using it and hopefully in the next few months you will be able to start to deploy applications over this, this system. Uh, I don't know if Marco has convinced you by now, but um, I think we all agree that consensus, the consensus layer of blockchains is uh, it's one of the key bottlenecks in the Web3. We need blockchains to, for coordination and orchestration in Web3, which means that we really need to fix this if we want to bring the type of Web2 applications uh, to the Web3 space. Because if we need a blockchain, we need consensus, and if we need consensus, we really need to scale this layer. If we look at, uh, Marco explained a bit uh, what, our what are our targets when, and in all the research that we're doing, and IPC is mainly focused on this. There was a question over there on what is the key element that IPC has compared to, to others. One that I think that is really important is partition tolerance. So if you see Polkadot and you disconnect a parachain pr from, the, from the main chain of Polkadot, you cannot keep working. If you go to Cosmos, you have to rely on the Cosmos hubs. So you have several limitations there. There's no way you can have a partition of the network. With IPC, we can do that. Like, we could have a local data center doing operations, and whenever you recover the connection, uh, you'll see in a moment in the implementation how this matches up, but you would be able to propagate that information. And this, actually, IPC, you see that there are other things like censorship resistance, VM independence. We don't enter into that. Like, with IPC, we were focusing on this, like trying to have scalability, fast consensus, and have this partition tolerance that we think that in blockchains, this is not really true right now. And this is actually the, the motivation. I mean, if you go to the sharding uh, approaches that we see out there, they are explicitly partitioning the state. So you're not letting users actually partition the state how they want or deploy the consensus algorithm that they want. It's really specific. So if you go to Polkadot, if you go to Cosmos, if you go to any of these uh, scaling approaches, you don't have a way of configuring the system for your needs. And actually, this is one of the things that we wanted to fix with IPC. Not only scalability, but also let the application, because we cannot come up with the best trade-off between security and performance. And what we say is that instead of trying to find the one-size-fits-all system, Let's try and let users configure the system and have a flexible system that allows us and allows applications to actually come up with uh, what they need. And uh, that's what we're trying with IPC. So we're trying to give a framework for anyone to be able to configure the system and configure the subnet to what they actually need. And in the process, what we realize is that it's actually a good idea to uh, allow um, the consensus community and like the distributed system community to test stuff. Because if you have a low cost, low barrier of entry way of deploying your own blockchain and deploying your own consensus algorithm, because we came up with interfaces, abstractions, and so on, that anyone can reuse to foster innovation and like test their ideas. So we're really looking forward to foster these kind of collaborations and, and like invite you to hack your own consensus into IPC or try your layer two approach in an IPC subnet or whatever you can come up with. So this is kind of like the motivation when we started designing um, IPC. And by now I think that uh, hopefully Guy has convinced you of what is the value of IPC and how it works. I'm gonna go a bit deeper into how we implement this. We already have an MVP and we will have a testnet soon. And how it works and or what you can do as a user with IPC is the following. So let's imagine again the, um, the Falcon mainnet as the root chain for instance, where we have 30 seconds um, block times. And we could even have a parallel checkpointing uh, network like Bitcoin. We actually have it in the case of Falcon. But the point is that with these 30 seconds, even in proof of work or with these 30 second block times, we cannot deploy our DeFi application or we cannot deploy the only funds as the new key application of Web3. So um, all of these applications, what they will be able to do as users is, and they actually can do now, is spawn their own subnets. So as a user, um, in, in IPC, what you will be able to say is, hey, I want to spawn a new subnet with these specific consensus and these specific properties, and we want to par validate transactions in parallel to the main chain, while keeping the ability of interoperating with the rest of the networks in the system. And this is recursive, so at some point, like the only fans is so um, popular that uh, we're going to divide the deployment into different zones, different availability zones, the same way that AWS works or whatever. In this case, we would be able to recursively from a subnet keep 
growing a subnet. Uh, one of the, of the key properties that we have security-wise, because we don't guarantee security within a subnet. Like three friends could spawn their own subnet, have their, the dumbest consensus where only one of them validates, and that's it. But we, every subnet, uh, we enforce in every subnet a firewall requirement. What we mean with a firewall requirement is that the, if there's an attack in a subnet, and there's a malicious committee in a subnet, the impact that it can have in the upper layers of the hierarchy is at most of the amount of, of Filecoin or the amount of native token, if we're in another chain, that we have injected in that subnet. So the circulating supply in that subnet. We can discuss on how we implement this and so on afterwards, but uh, this is one of the things that we want. We don't want to force a security guarantee, which is something that happens in Polkadot with the the audits, I think they call it, or something like that, or in Cosmos with the hubs. Here we want to leave users like free for all and for you to configure whatever security guarantees for real that you need. And how do we implement this right now? So I don't know if many of you know, uh, Filecoin is going to ship soon. I mean, actually, it's already in mainnet, but you will have a way of deploying user-defined actors. And uh, how we are implementing IPC is through a set of actors or smart contracts or the Filecoin network. Something that we want to do in the future is also translate them to Solidity so that you could have IPC in, in Ethereum, for instance. But um, the, the two key components in, uh, in IPC is two smart contracts, uh, what we call the IPC gateway. That is the main actor that implements all of the logic for a subnet and for the rootnet uh, for IPC. And then a subnet actor. And this, this subnet actor defines all of your policies for the subnet and defines how you want your subnet to operate. So if I'm a user and I want to deploy right now a new subnet in, in IPC, what I would do is deploy my subnet actor and say, hey, I want to deploy a subnet with this consensus algorithm. I want users or validators to join me to have this collateral. I want these security guarantees. You would define there and implement an interface for a subnet actor. From there on, like me and my friends would be able to start mining in a parallel chain. With the caveat that right now we are just a sidechain. If we really want to become a subnet able to interact with the rest of the hierarchy, I would have to register to the IPC gateway. And the IPC gateway has a, and this is the one that actually enforces this firewall requirement. The IPC gateway is the, the actor in our parent that will uh, enforce me set certain requirements if I want to interact with the rest of the hierarchy. So in this case, I would have to put some collateral in order to, to validate and be able to commit uh, some of my checkpoints and anchor my security to the chain. In the same way, another subnet would do exactly the same. I, uh, we, uh, if another user wants to deploy a subnet, they just deploy the subnet actor, define the behavior for their subnet, and then register to the IPC gateway so that uh, we can start sharing information with other subnets, interacting with the rest of the subnets, and in order to enforce this uh, firewall requirement. Uh, how, I mean, the way in which we implement this at a peer level, so this is like the architecture of the system, but if we go, like Marco mentioned that we're implementing this right now over the Falcon client, the way this looks like, it's super simple. Like, we share the transport layer, and then we spawn complete new stacks for each of these subnets. So in the end, the, when you deploy uh, a new subnet and you start syncing from your peer with a new subnet, what you're doing is having a new independent message pool, a new independent consensus, uh, the same VM and the same state tree because we keep the semantics. That's one of the tricks that we're doing. All of our blockchains are IPLD based, so they actually speak the same language. And this is an advantage because it's a way of, of having this interoperability by design. And the only thing that we share is a transport layer. So we share the broadcast layer so that we, we have a way of exchanging these messages between the different uh, subnets and the different um, peers that may be syncing with different subnets. And that's how it looks like from uh, like uh, implementation perspective at a peer level. And then I mentioned that um, one of the things that we can do as subnets is anchor our security to our parent chain. In the end, like this checkpointing protocol, what it does is it, it has two, two purposes. The first one is to anchor the security and uh, periodically anchor some proof of the state of my subnet. So I would be able to, for instance, this is uh, completely like the subnet actor can define what we include in a checkpoint and what we're going to propagate up. But the kind of information that we could have is, for instance, hey, I'm going to build a SAK proof, kind of a roll-up approach, to batch some transactions and have a way of, of, having, of leaving there a piece of my state so that I can build proof, fraud proofs. So we would be able to have a subnet that behaves like a roll-up. Or we could do something as naive as we're going, doing now, which is propagating some of my tip sets so that I 
leave small pieces of my chain, and I can build different types of fraud proofs or, or, or ways of proving misbehavior in my subnet. So this is something that the checkpoint protocol, protocol would allow us. And also, we use the checkpoint protocol as the way of, uh, because all of the subnets, so one of the requirements also for subnets I forgot to mention is that they need to sync with their parent, because they need to listen to events in the IPC gateway and the subnet actor to see what is happening there. Um, and the way, so go, sending information from the top of the, of the tree down is easy because we are all syncing with our parent, but sending it up is not as easy because like, I don't want to force my parent to avoid state explosion. I don't want my parent to be listening to all of its children. So how we fix this is through the checkpoints. We use checkpoints not only to anchor state security, but also to give it as a pipe to send information from the bottom layers of the, of the tree up. So um, in the end, like, Again, this is, we're trying this to, to be as general as we can and make it as, as flexible as possible so that you can implement whatever model you want. But how it works right now is that we divide, so we have uh, a checkpoint period that the subnet can choose. For instance, these uh, 100 blocks or epochs or what, how, I mean, depending on the blockchain, you can call this, this uh, time uh, as you want. And um, what we will do is that when in epoch 100, uh, we open the checkpointing window for epoch 200. And we will start collecting, so uh, the IPC gateway start collecting all of the cross net messages that need to be propagated up, and it tries, it's, it start building whatever information and proof of state of the subnet that we want to propagate up. When we reach the end of the checkpointing window, we have all of the information, and the validators of the subnet Again, like in the subnet actor, right now in the current implementation, what we uh, wait is for a super majority of the committee in the subnet to sign the checkpoint and propagate it to the parent. But like, we also we are also exploring to use what we're using for checkpoint, like threshold signature, to propagate the information. So you could come up with whatever uh, scheme you want, but the idea is that once everyone agrees that the the checkpoint epoch has uh, finished, there's uh, a protocol that decides how we're going to sign that checkpoint and propagate it up for, so that it's verified by the subnet actor. So in parallel, there's the signing of the previous epoch, and we open the, the, the window for the next epoch. And in this way, periodically, we are getting information that needs to be propagated up, and we have like kind of a clock of the system. I don't know if someone is an electrical engineer here, but when we are building like uh, circuits, you have uh, the main clock, and then you can have like different periods of clocks. That's the idea behind this, like to propagate information following these clocks of each subnet. And yeah, so this is uh, periodic. And I've been talking about anchoring security and sharing information, but how do we share this information? By now, ho hopefully, you kind of got an idea. We have like two main primitives, and if you've seen, um, so this is the first thing where Guy and I <laughs> disagreed a bit, and where he poked in the hole, and is the way of, of we propagate information. So in the, um, we have two main primitives to propagate information. We have what we call the top-down messages, that is the information that comes from the top of, from your parent, or the top of the hierarchy down. This one is quite easy, because as we are forcing uh, child subnets to be able to sign with their parent, because they need to keep track of the events in these two special actors. That's quite straightforward. We just listen to events. Uh, we pass the events through the consensus engine of the subnet, and we can all agree that something happened in the parent and something has to go down. For the bottom up, we have checkpoints. So that's also easy. We use the checkpoint protocol. We introduce some information there, and we uh, propagate it up. Actually, uh, the way we propagate information up and down is not, I mean, we can discuss it, and there are, uh, you can check the spec. But we, I mean, we are in an IPLD-based, which means content-addressed blockchain. So every information is content-addressed. We actually don't propagate full information. We propagate pointers to the information. That's one of the advantages of having a content address blockchain. We don't really need to propagate all of the information, but with pointers, we already have protocols to, to resolve this information and this content in the corresponding subnets and the corresponding blockchains. And this is where Guy and I <laughs> mainly uh, disagreed. Before, we had this path transaction that in the end, it was a combination of, of bottom-up transactions and top-down. These will probably be removed soon because as uh, with Guy's model, we want to restrict as much as possible. 
um, the communication before you could like trigger a transaction that went uh, several levels up and several levels down, which introduced this problem that I think someone asked, uh, how do you handle gas fees and so on? It really made it really complex. So that's how Guy came up with this model. Of let's make it instead of a single atomic uh, transaction, let's make it small atomic uh, transactions that we can reason about. So that's like the main chain that you may see in the spec these days and that will probably change with all of the things that a uh, guy has been working on. And Mark also mentioned, because, okay, this is great, we can send information from one subnet to the other, but what happens if we really need to use state, actual state, not only the native token, but actual state that lives in a smart contract in some other subnet? So for that, we came up with a cross-subnet atomic execution that I don't think I'll have time to, to explain, but basically, uh, it's a protocol Again, these, these are several, we were trying to come up with the primitives, and there are several ways, as an asynchronous approach and a, an asynchronous approach in which you can implement this. But the properties that we're looking for, the reference implementations that we're, we will ship with IPC is to have atomicity, timeliness, and unforgeability. So to have a way of locking state, the same way you do an atomic swap uh, with some asset, do kind of atomic swaps, but with state. So have a way in which we lock state in the subnets that are involved, and then we have the parent chain or the common parent for both or all the subnets involved to be the judge of the execution. So we lock state, we have a primitive to lock state in the subnet, and then we have the common parent as a judge that says, hey, either the lock has been correct, uh, there are a set of primitives, again, like, we can go in depth, there's a spec that explains it. This is also going to change because we realize that we can make it simpler. So Guy keeps poking. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that we not only should be able to exchange uh, some native token, but we should be able to actually perform uh, executions with state involving several subnets. Uh, Guy already uh, talked a bit about this, like there are other approaches, we are not that novel, but like we think that we can take ideas and inspiration from several of these places. And we have discussions, this, Marco already mentioned this also, like we are really open on our work, so if you think that you have an idea or you say, hey, I've seen that Avalanche subnets are way better than what you're doing, please let us know. <laughs> like we have, a, this is an example of a GitHub discussion where we're discussing like what are the the comparisons, like competitive analysis compared to, to HC, we would love to, sorry, IPC, we would love to know more about this. And it, I mean, if you like this and you want to try it, what we have right now? So we have Eudico, which is uh, these, uh, it's a fork of Falcon where we implement all of our ideas, research ideas. So it's not production ready, it's where we implement our MVPs, but in Eudico already you have IPC and you, you could start deploying your subnets and like testing this concept of having parallel chains that interact with, with each other with this checkpoint protocol already implemented. So this would be the, a best, uh, like the best way to start right now, like today. Uh, we are trying to push this into the Falcon mainnet. Hopefully Q3 next year, you should be able to deploy subnets in the Falcon mainnet. And we already have a FIP, a Falcon improvement proposal, where we explain the specification and what we are trying to push into the network soon. If this is not enough for you and you want to go like really deep, we also wrote a spec that will receive an update soon. So uh, here we, we try to explain low level, really low level for anyone that is looking to implement the protocol, the specifications for IPC. Again, it may be a bit outdated with all of the changes that we, have, uh, we had lately, but uh, we're going to do an update soon. Any question that you may have, again, we're in Slack, we're in GitHub, so feel free to, to ping us. And there's also a paper. Like we, uh, we try to follow research in an academic way also, so we did a position paper in a workshop so that anyone could have a high-level overview of the system with a related work and more of a, an academic approach. Uh, there are a lot of models here this, um, that within, so that impact the implementation of, of IPC, and one of the key things that we're focusing on right now is that, as, men as Marco mentioned, we are trying to have a testnet soon, so that any user can start thinking about use cases and, and, and like we can stress tes testing this idea and see the kind of new use cases that from the Web2 world that we can bring to the Web3 before we made it to mainnet. So by the end of this year, uh, you should be able to start deploying FVM, Falcon Virtual Machine uh, applications and Solidity contracts in this uh, SpaceNet with a fast consensus so that you can start testing these ideas and 
by Q1, we should be able, you should be able as a user to deploy your own subnets and uh, have what we have today in Eudico as a more, proto you know, a more prototype um, uh, level. Uh, I think that Juan is already here and he's going to talk about use cases, so I'm going to go fast over this. Um, and yeah, so already mentioned this, if you want to test IPC today, you have Eudico, but if you can wait a few months, you will have SpaceNet as a testnet uh, to start testing all of the use cases that Juan is going to talk about. I was planning to do a demo, but uh, I don't have my computer, so we can do a demo in a breakout <laughs> afterwards. I can show you how to install Eudico and like, how to use it. But I'm going to use this time, as we were running a bit late, I'm going to use this time to, for any question or discussions that you may have right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, any question? <laughs> I don't see, so please <laughs> just speak up. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk and for the presentation. Uh, in the beginning, you told about partition tolerance and that like kind of your competitive advantage and uh, uh, mentioned that like, for example, Falkada doesn't have it. May you please explain how like really partition tolerance like is uh, like in place because like it's not super clear to be honest. Yeah, okay, so the, the, the keys here is in the checkpointing protocol. Um, if we have so if you have, for instance, this uh, architecture where you have like root T01 and it's disconnected from the root net, as long as the v validators and like the, the nodes that are part of this subnet are able to still uh, run the consensus, they can still operate with each other. Of course, they won't be able to propagate information to each other, but they will be able to uh, advance in their chain, keep doing their stuff between them, and batch these checkpoints. So the, the how it works is that we keep advancing on our chain, we keep doing our checkpoints, but as we are partitioned, we cannot propagate it up to the root net so that it propagates uh, further to the rest of the system. The moment we recover the, the, the connection, we batch these checkpoints, send them up, and from there on, like, all of the information that was pending will be propagated to the rest of the system. Uh, okay, and so uh, if there's like conflicts between these partitions, how do they, how are they resolved? Uh, after the connection is restored? Right, so um, that's a great question, and the, the <laughs> we would have to, to figure it out, but like there cannot be conflicts at this point. Yeah, but this is definition of partition tolerance. Like sure, but no, there cannot be, because you, don't, you cannot interact with the rest of the state. You only interact with your own state, and you're batching uh, transactions. It's like the actor model, right? You have, it's, it's exactly the actor model, where, where you have a, an outbox, and the next subnet will have an inbox. I'm just, when, I part, when I'm partitioned, what happens is that I, I will increase my, outbooks, my outbox, and then eventually when I have a connection again, I will start sending messages, and there, there is an, in, an inbox actually in how it's implemented this in the other subnet. It's uh, uh, the first thing, first come, first served. So uh, as I am only interacting with my own state, the, it's limited the amount of conflicts that I can have. If, I mean, if I'm re relying on, or, or I'm touching state somewhere else, if I uh, arrive late, that's it. I mean, my message is... Yeah. So I just need to clarify a little bit more. Uh, so basically, uh, after the connection is restored, you validate which, if there's conflict, you validate which was the first in which partition, and you take it as a source of truth. And the others, what do they do? Do they roll back the state of all the partitions? So actually how it works is that um, my outbox go out, and in order for my message to get in the next subnet, it has to go through the committee, so through the consensus engine. And is the consensus engine the one that chooses the, if there's conflict or not? So if your message is touching a state that it's completely outdated, it will be rejected and not accepted the transaction. Okay, but how do you validate the time of che checkpoint? Because each submit can fake a time of checkpoint. No, 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 what you have is that, that you have an order, a checkpointing order in your local subnet. And this is what you propagate up. It's with a unique nonce and like a total order that you order already in your subnet. This is propagated up. And then the moment it's propagated up, the, the one, so it's the consensus engine, I mean, you have only your local view. So the parent will only see the local view. The, the, it will see the order within your own checkpoints. 
and then um, the checkpoints that are coming from other children, and they process it in parallel. If there's conflict in one of, the, of them, um, you're, so it's, it's, there are unique nonces between all of the, so it's in the order of the consensus engine accepting and validating the transaction of propagating the checkpoint up. I don't know if this makes sense. Uh, yeah, kind of is. And like the, the last question is, uh, are checkpoints deterministic or no? They're deterministic, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There's another question right there. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the hierarchical design. So I guess uh, if you think about the setup, so do you envisage some sort of a relationship between the parent and child node sets or some form of like shared security like it's suggested in, Cons in, in Cosmos 2 or Polkadot has a notion of shared security as well? Or are these things entirely up to sort of the definer of these things, right? So that's sort of one question. The second question is about uh, the connection potentially between, you know, the fee structure. So can you have something that's an expensive chain that's a child of a cheap chain or the other way around to envisage interesting? Because, I mean, these designs, I mean, um, well, the, the last question specifically does come up in these designs quite a lot. Yeah, and it's a really good question. So for the first one, we, I mean, the only requirement is that you should be able to sync with the parent. So it's up to you to choose the parent. I mean, we, if you go to a subnet, a, chi a child subnet that has a security which is weak and doesn't have their kind of security guarantees, it's up to you. It's like an NLC. And actually, uh, something that I went really fast through, um, the, IP, the IPC gateway uh, re requires a minimum collateral that each subnet can choose which one it is. And you keep it keeps track of the circulating supply and the collateral that validators have put there. And that's, of course, is not like uh, absolute truth, but it gives you an indication of what is the stake that the validators there have in the, in the network. Because this, in subnet, we also have fraud proofs, so you can implement fraud proofs, and you can slash the collateral of that uh, gateway. So that's the only thing that, so we have some knobs that you can fine tune for your use case, but we don't force anything. Like, you need some collateral, and, and you have a, a, a metric to know like how good or bad that subnet is, but it's on you how you, interact with it. Does this answer your question? I think so. I mean, it's an interesting question about what the steady state might become, sort of comes up in DPoS systems, for example, quite yep. a lot, sort yep. of similar social sort of interactions, if you will. And, and in terms of the fee structure, the second part? Yeah, so for the fee structure, it's a really good question. We want it, so at some point we were thinking that we want even subnets that are free, if that's okay with the validators. But of course, this, we have this checkpointing fee. So you would have to pay fees in the root net, in order to checkpoint to the root net, the same for your parent, and so on. And uh, we actually, we don't have anything published yet, but we have a CryptoEcon uh, analysis that the CryptoEcon lab at Protocol Labs uh, helped, us, helped us do. And what we realized is that the only way that you can fine tune like the, the demand, so, so actually this is driven by demand. So in the end, you will end up having uh, more subnets or, more, or deeper levels according to the demand that you have. And the key, tweaking point is not actually the fees, because like actually a single account, like this a, a pair of keys can be used to transact in all of the subnets. So we don't touch that. The semantics are the same in all of the subnets right now. They are IPLD based blockchains and we use the same uh, like semantics and structure. But if you want to influence how cheap or expensive or, or you, can, you want to improve demand, what you can play with is the checkpointing period, right? So these will make, uh, so, it, if I want, uh, I don't want checkpoint, like ch ch child subnets, what actually I'm gonna fine tune is not the, the like passing by messages, but actually the checkpointing fee. I'm gonna put a really high checkpointing fee because I don't want anyone to be checkpointing to me. I just want to be the source of transactions. And you can play with this to influence like from your point down, of course you can only influence your point down, but from your point down, what, what is the actual architecture that you want? So it's kind of user driven, because like you have all of these knobs that would allow you to, I mean, that, we really don't know what is this gonna look yeah, yeah. like. So you have some control mechanisms. I guess it's not obvious yes. how it doesn't become a race to the bottom, but that's a longer question, so. Yeah, yeah. one of the reasons for this space net is exactly this, like realize how people will use this so that we can, before we go to mainnet, we can realize what is what we need to actually uh, like fine tune and, and improve in the design. Because our assumption is that maybe 
the first layer, as you have to go to rootnet, and rootnet may potentially have more fees. Um, we will have just one level, and that would be enough, but maybe we realize that we have more than three levels, so we really don't know how people will use it because this is really demand-driven. And that's why we want to have a <laughs> testnet as soon as possible and onboard uh, applications.